Hi, everybody. Konnichiwa. And so you people out there in Palm Springs, you're awesome. And the picture that you'll see behind me there is from yesterday. We had a great time out there. You know, I can actually feel you right now. I can feel the energy from you. And I think that's an amazing thing and a wonderful thing that people can do this when they get together. And I also think, think that there is a very deep and profound truth in this, that when people come together, uh, things happen. And one of the most important things that happens this way is that when we try to make sense of the world around us, it's not just something that we do on our own, really. In fact, I think we are pretty poor at making sense of the world on our own. We're much better at doing that together. And uh, I call this a loop, by the way. Um, so the process of making sense of the world is not really a linear thing, from the mind to the world or from the world to the mind, but it goes through other people all the time. Part of that is socially constructed by the people that were here before us, you could say. But equally important, it's also socially negotiated right here, right now, as we meet other people. And we understand what's going on in the faces and in the eyes of those around us. My journey to a deep understanding of this began some years ago on a very dark November night when the police came calling to my door late and informed me that there's been an accident involving my father and my mother. They were in the back seat of a car on the way home from a party. I imagined them happy, holding hands, and they met with a very, very large truck. And as I talked to the officers and drove across the country, across the country um, to talk with the hospital staff and formally identify both of them, I knew what was going on, but it didn't make any sense and there was no point. That came later, in the days and the weeks and the months after, when I was talking to friends, families and neighbors. And through their eyes and their faces and their reactions, I understood what was going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I have this Android copy of myself, um, this robot thing. And people often ask me, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to make this robot copy of yourself? Uh, you see the pictures behind me is uh, part of the production process of that. It's not always pretty, but it is honest. And um, uh, it's also some stuff that we've been doing with him over the last year. Uh, the obvious answer to the question is lack of impulse control. But there is also a deep, uh, <laughs> profound question, answer, I think, uh, that I want to share with you today. And that is, I want to put an Android in that loop, because that helps me understand what's going on in the world around me. And I thought it would be nice to have him here on stage to uh, share this moment with me and with you. So here he is. Please welcome the Geminoid DK. This robot was built in Japan. It's in a line of robots that we call Gemeloids, Gemeloids Twin Robots, and DK is short for Denmark, where we both live. Good morning, Henrik. Good morning, DK. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. But I am still a little stiff from lying in the crate on the flight over here. Yeah, on the customs, right? That will pass. Yeah, I should hope so. So, DK, what's it like to be the android in the loop? Well, sometimes people don't even realize I'm an android. They think I'm a human being, and they treat me accordingly. Do you remember the demonstration in Copenhagen? Yeah. The one where several people would walk into the room, say hi to you, say hi to me, and then leave again while asking for directions to the robot. Yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> and then there was this other time. I remember a little boy asking his father, Dad, are they both robots? That was crazy, yeah. too. In that case, you were perceived as a robot. How does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, that is a little unsettling, but we're getting used to it. So, DK, um, what can we learn from your interactions with people? We can learn many things, I would think. I'd like to mention three. Okay. In the first place, we have learned that if the context is real and working, then people are very tolerant towards Android partners. We can build trust between us. Now we can also predict, with some certainty at least, in which cases people are likely to react strongly 
both positively and negatively. That sounds cool. What else? In the second place, we're beginning to learn how age affects the interaction between human and robot. Mm -hmm. Especially with young children, there are some concerns about the very realistic androids. Right. But I think we can begin to design our way around some of those issues. Okay. Anything else? Right. In the third place, we're beginning to understand that there are also some gender differences in the perception of androids. Indications are that women are more sensitive toward shortcomings in my design than men. Ah. And that it is perhaps easier for men to accept android partners for communication. Makes sense. But of course that may also have to do with the fact that I am male. Yeah. Okay. And as usual, all of these findings do require further studies. Ah, we're scientists, right? So that's how it goes. Well, thank you. You're most welcome. You can Let take me know if I can be of further assistance. I will. You can take a little rest now. So in our culture, there is a deep urge to correct and perfect things. And in our technological time, what we tend to do is replace stuff that hurts or is potentially hurtful with technology. And there is a lot of good in that. But over the last year, couple of years, I've come to think that I think we are also in danger uh, of doing something really, really bad if we do this. There is a, an ancient word describing uh, what happens when you take away all the things that can happen in a negative way to you and leave you with actually nothing. And that word is nirvana. In this case, it would be robo-nirvana if we replace ourselves uh, in this uh, kind of sense with robotic machines. Now, for me, at least, this can never be about replacing the human being. This can be about embracing the wonderful technologies of our time to gain a deeper and fuller understanding of the full spectrum of what it means to be a human being. And the reason for this is actually that it's not only the good things in life that makes us connect and make us understand each other. It's also the hardship and those bad experiences that we have, which are traces of life that's been lived. Those experience, experiences enable us to connect. Many of you have probably also felt this mind-splitting experience of being in love with someone who does not reciprocate the feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the wonderful thing about resting in the arms of someone you love. Here in my hands, I have scars. I have one right here. This is a scar from a meeting with a surprisingly sharp knife in the school kitchen many years ago, when I damn near cut my finger in half. Now, uh, the DK has the same scar in his hand. It's right here. Um, but only I have the memory of it, and only I have the memory of the healing process, which took some time and was uh, a little bit painful. And those kinds of things uh, add up to the stuff that's really important to us. Today, this scar goes with a collection of other scars in my body, which are emblematic of the life that I lived and the choices I'd made and the stuff that happened to me. And you know what it's about because you have similar experiences, don't you? I'm thinking you, sir, maybe have lost someone else. So you know what this is. And I'm thinking you, miss, you have been in love. Yeah, I can tell. And actually, I think, sir, that there might be a scar on that hand you're holding right there. No? On the other hand, okay, <laughs> that's how it goes then, on the other hand. For me, it is not about replacing the human being. I think that would be a big mistake. Rather than that, we should take these things, all these wonderful technologies of our, of our time that are so important to us, and place them in these loops. And that helps us understand in new and fascinating ways stuff that's really, really important and pertinent to our own lives. And I think uh, that this uh, way of extending the loop that is between people can actually change the way that we think, not only about uh, ourselves, but also about the people around us in a very uh, positive way. So for me, this is my prism. This is my uh, thinking tool number one for unlocking some of all that mystery that's in the world. And when I do that, yeah, we're flying here, that was crazy. Um, when I do that, Lots of things, things popped to my attention that was previously not so interesting and perhaps not even visible to me. 
So the tiny differences in the way that we act and the way that robots communicate with us uh, really accentuates these wonderful things that are important parts of our lives. And then, sometimes, incidentally, when I sit in my lab with all the computers and all the data that we collected, trying to figure out what's going on in these loops, and I look across the table, and I see him. I laugh a little bit, and sometimes I glance just a little, little thing there. And you know what it is that I see? Myself? No. I catch this tiny little glimpse from time to time of my father. Yeah. He was blind. And um, his eyes would often walk across the room like this without focusing on anything particular, like the robot. So I see him, and I remember, and that makes me happy. Have a nice day. And stay in the loop. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Henrik, I, I got to ask you a question, though. I mean, I found it, and even right now, I find it socially almost uncomfortable standing next to your pal here. Like, you don't know what to, to do. But, and so, I mean, there's something amazing here in that that physical likeness, you know, it presses all kinds of human buttons. But at the same time, until you've got the speech thing right, until we've actually made progress in artificial intelligence and it can feel like a real conversation, it just seems creepy, doesn't it? <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> but but do, do you worry that this is, in a way, possibly ahead of its time and that until the artificial intelligence side and the, the actual interaction side can be solved, it, it's kind of a dead end and there's, there's more, there, you know, the, those flying nanobots is, is, mm. is where the robotic advance is. No, I actually see those things as converging. We see so many different kinds of, of progress in many, many different uh, technical disciplines. What, what really is uh, the, the stopping block at this moment is that we need for all of those technologies to converge. And that is going to happen over the next five to ten years. So my prediction would be that ten years from now, you can get me back here, uh, and I will be sitting at my home in sunny Denmark enjoying a beer on my porch. All right. And he and will be doing this talk. Are you, are you willing to come? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right.